Hello and welcome to the Weekend Podcast, your window to the life in the UAE. This is Anamika Chatterjee and I'm the editor of Weekend Magazine. This is the Weekend Magazine Podcast by Kalish Times. So my guest is someone whose voice you've heard on the radio many times. <laughs> she has done a TED Talk which has the highest number of views in the whole of UAE. Is that right? I think so. I haven't, I mean, I haven't found... 23 million. 23 million is a big number. I know. I, I kind of pinch myself about it very often. And I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure there's not some kind of glitch in the system? <laughs> she was also at the peak of her career when she decided to leave everything and start her own company. Is that right? Um, yeah, I, I was, um, it was an interesting year. It was 2020 when I decided to quit radio. Um, and I bought over the hype. So it existed. Mm. It was a small business. And I used to sort of spend a few hours there every week. And I would teach. Um, but then I decided the time had come for me to do something crazy and daring. And uh, it was also a COVID year. So <laughs> it was 2020. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit crazier than, than you know, you'd imagine. But yeah. <laughs> but the real reason we have Malvika Varadhan today here is because she has penned this beautiful piece on climbing Mount Kilimanjaro as a pilgrimage to her father who had a paralytic stroke and was confined to his bed and wheelchair for most part of her growing up years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What led you to take up this? Uh, take up Kilimanjaro? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's hard for me to describe what it's really like to be the child of somebody who uh, where you're not just the child but you're also one of the caregivers of the family, right? And uh, in all of my interactions with so many hundreds of children every day, I rarely find stories uh, similar to mine. So I know it's a bit of a rarity. So when I was nine years old, my dad had a paralytic stroke. Uh, now, my dad was also my best friend. I've never been much of an extrovert. I know it's hard to believe because I come with this like bundle of energy around me. But I'm actually someone who's very introverted. Um, I mostly spend time by myself. And as a kid, I was a little nerd who would be sitting with my books and so my dad was my best friend um, and when he had this stroke, it was difficult for everyone in the, in the family. My mom, of course, had to suddenly at the age of 49, figure out how she was going to raise these two daughters um, on a very normal middle class bank clerk salary in, you know, um, and that kind of income. Um, how old were you then, Malvika? I was nine years old. Yeah, I was nine. Um, and it was just, you know, our, our family life was going fantastically. Just the way you'd imagine in the early, you know, mid-90s, this is 1996, uh, we just bought a new house, I had moved school, I was nine, my sister was uh, 15, my mom was 49, and we were like, what do you think an average Desi family of that, you know, that, that you know, with, with those kind of components uh, is like. And then one fine day, one evening, he just had a stroke and it came out of absolutely nowhere and he was in the ICU for a couple of days and then uh, when he came out of the ICU and he was you know in the hospital we realized that he had lost his speech which uh, was a it was a very particular almost poetic um, ability for him to lose because this was a man who was a publisher and he was surrounded by words he was a he was a storyteller he was a he was someone who enjoyed talking to people and words were his way through the world and it was you know, he, I inherited that from him, my love for words and my love for books. And for all things in the world, for him to have lost his, his means of speaking was just, it was a huge, it, it was a huge, huge, huge thing for him to lose, right? And um, alongside his loss of speech, his inability to speak, he was also uh, paralyzed on the right side of his body. And so he was confined to a wheelchair. Uh, and it took years and years and years of physiotherapy for him to be able to even do something quite simple like walk to the bathroom or to be able to like walk to the door or you know every tiny thing that you kind of see around you and you you take for granted was an enormous struggle for my father and you know by extension our entire family so it was grief essentially that you wanted to process your grief by climbing the mountain which is the ultimate pinnacle of achievement when it comes to movement right yes yeah, it's a bit of a long story, isn't it? I, I drifted into the first part of it. <laughs> but yeah, so I spent 25 years, um, you know, with my dad. Um, some of those years were here in the UAE. And he passed away on the 1st of February, um, 2022. And, you know, I, I guess, like I was telling a friend of mine this morning, I, there is there's something very important about ritual, right? 
uh, there's a reason why when people pass away they have this you know 11 days or 13 days and they have these um, ceremonies where people gather and they come and they do pujas or they do you know th there's always there's a sense of ceremony around saying goodbye to someone uh, my family is not particularly religious um, if anything both my parents were liberals like I am um, so we didn't really have any of those things to turn to. We didn't have any major pujas or ceremonies or it, it was all a very simple, you know, immersing of the ashes and that's it, it was done. And I thought to myself, one year from now, on the 1st of February 2023, the last thing I want to be doing is just sitting around a table and, you know, eventually the conversation will drift away from my father and it will become about the kids need to eat this or like put on the television or and, and then it will just go away and it I just needed for there to be some sense of ceremony around it. So I thought to myself, what can I build that could be a daily ritual of grief? Um, a place for me to pay my respects to a man who taught me the importance of movement through his stillness, who taught me the importance of words through his silence. And I thought, okay, let's climb the mountain. He would love to climb the mountain. When I was a kid and before he had a stroke, he would always tell me that when you turn 18, we'll go to the Himalayas together and we'll do a trek. And of course, we could never do that. And often my mom and dad would watch travel channels and they would say, oh, we'd love to be there. And he'd say, I want to go, I want to go. And of course, there were many parts of the world that he could never travel to. And just by virtue of being on a wheelchair, there were many things that he could never do. And I felt like, quite simply, this was a way of appreciating the fact that I have legs that work. And I've got to use them. And somehow through that movement, I need to find my connection to my father. I need to go to a place that's still and silent where I can hear him. If that's what it's going to take, climbing a mountain. Okay, let's climb the mountain. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty much the story of Kilimanjaro. And it took you six months to prepare this. Yeah, I've, I, I mean, I'm not terribly unfit, but I don't think I was in Kilimanjaro state. Um, so I signed up with a gym and I had a trainer and I worked towards this for six months. You know, a lot of it is, a lot of it is comically slow, by the way. You know, you imagine climbing a mountain means like you're going to be lifting these heavy weights and you'll be doing all these very heroic things. But actually a lot of it was just put on a backpack and walk. And you walk three hours with a backpack on. So it's all pretty boring if you, if you, you know, look at it like that. It's comically slow. Uh, but yeah, for six months I would, uh, put on a backpack and either walk or do the stairs in my building which meant you go up. I would live in a seven floor building which is not very high and I'd go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and sometimes you'd have to do like a hundred floors or two hundred floors and you just keep doing this over and over and over again and there's a sense of repetition in it but the good thing um, about the training is I also got to listen to a lot of my favorite podcasts and I got to listen to a lot of good audio books and yeah and that kind of helped me uh, stay interested in the training as well. You know, my favorite part of the article is the particular portion where you write about how, how you were overcome with grief. You were almost in tears yeah. when your guide came and, you know, comforted you. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's somebody who you will, you will probably never meet, never meet again. again. Yeah. 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 Can you talk a little bit about that? What, yeah. why were you so moved? So moved, so overwhelmed. So here's a group of people who went to Kilimanjaro who are all extremely accomplished, right? If you look at those people and you, they all would have put their business cards on a table, you'd go, wow, oh my God, like head of this firm and head of this bank and, you know, managing these many millions in business. And But when we start out on that journey on summit night, there is something that happens to all of these people who are usually the most powerful people in the room. They're the ones who usually always have their voice heard. And suddenly they are reduced to a person with a backpack with a true physical challenge and an obstacle in front of them. And there your business card doesn't matter. You know, your power, your money, your influence, it doesn't matter. And your legs hurt. And you are, it is hard. It is hard. It is cold. It is scary. You're freezing. You really want to sit down and you're asking for a break. But your team leader says, no, you've got to walk. And you can only take that three minute break at the top of the hour, which means if we start at 12 o'clock, your next break is at one you got to keep pushing until one. And you can be the head of whoever. <laughs> you can be the most influential person in the room. You can have 23 million, whatever. I don't care. You sit when I tell you to sit. And so, you know, you sit down and you are cold and you are scared and you are hungry and you are thirsty and you are unsure of whether you have it in you to move on. And 
a guide who's a local Tanzanian guide comes to you and he opens a bottle. You're, you're, you're shaking so much that you can't even take off your gloves to get your own water bottle, right? So it's like somebody has to open that bottle and he like holds it to my mouth and he and he gives me that water and he, you know, my nose is running, I'm crying a little bit, so like my face is a mess and he wipes my face and he says, don't worry, you're going to carry on, you're going to be fine. And it kind of, in that moment, I realized what it must have meant for my dad to be that helpless as well, right? Because here you are, a man who's had a career and a family and is used to having his voice heard, but suddenly you're sitting in a wheelchair and someone needs to wipe your nose and someone needs to take you to the bathroom and someone needs to help you have a bath. And it's not comfortable to talk about these things, but it's true. And I hope that none of us are reduced to that state of helplessness in our lives, but there's a high chance that we probably will. And maybe there is a lesson in that. Maybe it's time for us to think about how dependent we really are on others to get through this crazy life that we lead. And that's what it means to be human, you know? You think you can do it all and you can have it all, but sometimes you just need to sit down and let someone else wipe your tears and hold your hand and tell you you'll be okay. And that's the magic of being human, you know? And, and it's like, I can't remember who said this and I wish I did, but it's like we're all just walking each other home at the end of the day. That's true. And and sometimes you meet people and you're the one wiping the tears and sometimes you're the one crying, but that's just the way life goes. And it is such a beautiful metaphor for life, you know, what your yeah. uh, guide told you, you have to carry on. Yeah, you got to carry on. Yeah. yeah. What was that one most challenging moment during the trek? So on the night of summit, um, so most of the days when you trek Kilimanjaro, and by the way, 50,000 people do this every year. So this is not, this is <laughs> by no means a story unique to me. But I have the words and I have the platform to share what it means with you. Um, so what happens is that you have something called summit night, right? Which means you've trekked the whole day and you've arrived at your camp by like, four, like maybe 2, 2.30. And then you like eat a little bit and you're told to go to sleep and you put on all your gear. So when I say all your gear, you're talking about like four layers on you. So you're wearing your thermal and then a t-shirt and then a jacket and then a hard shell on top of that, your pants, you've got like four layers, your, even your gloves, you've got gloves and then you've got ski gloves on top. So you wear all this stuff and then you go to sleep and then at 11 o'clock in the night, you get a wrapping on your tent and they say, okay, it's time for us to go. So you go quickly to the, to the common tent and everybody has like a little bit of something, some coffee or whatever to get you going. And then you set out in the middle of the night. Now you're wearing nothing but a head torch we were out on a full moon night, so you could see this giant glowing moon in the sky. You look behind you and you the closest thing you can see is Moshi City, which is like way below you because by then you've already climbed five days. So you're, it's way, way below you. And there is no other life. There is no other life you see outside of the trekkers who are going up. There's no birds. There's no, you know, there's no animal. There's no tree. It's just rock. And the first hour, you know, you have this big adrenaline rush because you're like, oh my God, today is going to be summit night. I'm going to reach the top. By the second hour, you're starting to get a little bit tired. We started to sing, we, you know, we started playing Antakshari and we like sing old Kishore Kumar songs or old Bollywood songs that we all knew. By the third hour, the songs slowly started getting softer and softer because you barely have the breath to keep going. And around four o'clock in the night, when it's at the depth of it, the darkness and, and the depth of the night really you think is the sun ever going to come up because it feels like I've been doing this for years like it just the night feels so long and so dark and Sean who was our team leader kept telling us guys just wait for sunrise when the, when something happens when the dawn cracks when the dawn cracks you will be filled with hope but you've got to push through this last hour and the last hour I just kept talking to myself and it was just you know telling yourself that you can do this, you can do this, till I rise, till I rise. You just want to, you want to have a mantra of some sort. You want to have, I guess if I were more religious, I would have a religious mantra that I could, I could, you know, chew on in those hours. But you, you, you reach whatever lies in the depths of your mind, which is for me, poetry and books and literature. And these are the stories that, you know, my mind is filled with. And so I, I reached out to those lines and words that my father would say to me and my mom would say to me. And you just keep repeating it yourself and say, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And I think about the 25 years that my father pushed through, through pain, through all kinds of therapy, all kinds of injections, all kinds of hospital visits, all kinds of incisions. And 
breaks in his body, but he pushed through for 25 years. So I guess I'm the daughter of uh, perseverance and positivity. So if he could do it, it's the same thing running in my veins. And if my mom could push through for 25 years of her marriage, taking care of this man as a caregiver, as opposed to an equal and a husband, so I can push through. And so I pushed through and when that dawn breaks, oh my God, I can't tell you, Anamika, when that dawn breaks, there is a palpable change of energy and you realize that you are just like the birds and the trees. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, some armchair philosopher, but <laughs> there is a, so, suddenly you realize, I can just, you know, what does it even matter? All these labels of business this and entrepreneur that and million this and million that. What does it matter? I'm just like that crow. You know, just like that bird that wakes up at five in the morning and realizes, chalo, dawn has broken. It's time for me to hit the sky. And you feel filled with this energy and then you go on. And um, yeah, it took another two, two to three hours for us, us to push through. That moment when you reach the top, you just fall to the floor with grief and overwhelm and um, gratitude and love. It's just pure love. What does climbing the mountain change for the person in you? What has it changed for you? I think often in life, especially when we when we like in countries like the UAE, uh, where we've all, we've all come here really to make money. We've all come here because we know that the conversion rate is higher than what it is back home. Or this is going to enable buying this or renting that or remitting this amount of money. We can get so caught up in this cycle of branches and you know brands and building and you want to get higher, you want to get faster, you want to get richer, you want to get bigger. And I think when you take a trip like this and you come back, it's really funny because you land back into rooms where the conversation is exactly what it was a week ago. People are still gossiping about what they were gossiping about. They're still upset about the same traffic signal. They're still, you know, nothing's changed with the city, but you come back with this, oh my God, do you know what's out there? Like this, Something has fundamentally shifted within you. And I think that what we must gift ourselves in, in life as often as we can is the opportunity to step off that wheel and do whatever it is. For me, it was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Right? Maybe for somebody else, it means, I don't know, um, going, go, going for a holiday or taking a solo trip or, you know, finding a new hobby or learning an instrument or running a marathon. Or, I, I don't know what this is to different people, but I think if we don't step off that hamster wheel, we find ourselves running and running and running and one day eventually we'll die. <laughs> and that's kind of the sad part, right? And life is short. It's too short for us to not stop. Yeah, and the realization that ultimately no matter wherever you are, you're in a pond and you have to step outside and experience the world. Yeah, you really do. You have to gift yourself that. You have to gift yourself that. And I was listening to um, this beautiful podcast the other day about grief and um, this writer, she said this, she said, you know, grief, it, it almost, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it kind of pushes you off your path, right? It destabilizes you. When you lose someone you really love, or, or even if you just lose a job you, where, where your identity is that job, you know? When, you're, when the core of you is shaken, whether that is because of heartbreak, loss, grief, a job loss, whatever, I think it offers you the opportunity to come back with a renewed meaning for what you do. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you come back and then suddenly you're like this transformed guru who's going to wear robes and chant all day. But it means that you come back with a, with a renewed sense of why am I doing this? Why do I wake up every morning? Why do I do what I do? Who are the people who are important? What are the things that are important? What, what are my core values? And how can I align that as much as possible to the things I surround my day and my life with? And yeah, I think that's what fundamentally needs to happen every once in a while. Maybe that's the reason people do pilgrimages, right? Well said, yes. And, and for those of us who have no, you know, pilgrimage that we really subscribe to or that, that we can go to, I think it's important for us to find other ways to make that to make that shift happen. It's like a Rubik's Cube, you know? It all seems like a mess and then suddenly tap, 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 three moves and you're done. It's like suddenly it's all aligned. Suddenly you see it. You see it. You just see it, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much, Malvika, for such a spoken conversation. And to all the listeners of this podcast, please read Malvika's extremely well-written spoken piece on how grief 
compelled her to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. To all those who are listening to this podcast, please share your thoughts in the comment section of our social media platforms. Till then, this is Anamika Chatterjee signing off. Thank you.